Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the book launch of Culinary Tales from Balochistan. Um, this is a book by uh, Nilafar Afridi Kazi, uh, whom I have known for a few years now, uh, back from Pakistan. Um, everybody in Islamabad knows her. <laughs> um, somebody, uh, you know, the, the, there are several ways of, uh, you know, of, of knowing Nilafar. Uh, what brings us here together is uh, our different relationship with her, but most importantly that she's been uh, mapping Pakistan's food in 100 districts uh, throughout the country. And, uh, and this is actually her effort put together on, on, on Balochistan, which we're going to talk uh, to her about. Um, she's from Balochistan, from the famous Kazi family, Kazis of Pasheen. Um, and <clears throat> for many of us who live in Islamabad, she's the daughter of uh, a very renowned Pakistani diplomat, Ashraf Jahangir Kazi, uh, very senior, very knowledgeable, uh, you know, and, and one is proud of him and, and, and uh, his achievements. But this is a time for us to be proud of his daughter's achievements too. Um, the last time we were together in Islamabad, uh, I'm reminded, you know, when I was reading, going through this book, I was reminded of uh, in F11 sector in Islamabad, there, there somebody opened a shop, which was Sindhi restaurant, uh, food from Sindh. And she harassed, Nilofar harassed the poor man, the restaurant owner. And her demand was, why are you serving us, uh, you know, ordinary food? Why aren't you serving us food from Sindh? Uh, so, and that is what she has set out to do in this book. Bring out the food, what people eat, uh, in, 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 in Pakistan. I mean, the, the Dhaba food, the food that, the Mughlai food that we, you know, always talk about, um, you know, at one level, there is, there is very little to distinguish, you know, the Indian food from the Pakistani food. And what she's been trying to say is that, yes, there are commonalities, but there is much more else to explore in Pakistani food. And so there, there is, this is a first effort. So, I'll I'll shut up and um, and 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 welcome her to the size event South Asia Institute um, uh, at SOAS, uh, which have been very kind in allowing us to host this event. So I'll start, Nilofar, um, asking you in five minutes to explain to the audience why was it important for you to write about food from Balochistan. Thank you, Aisha. Dr. Aisha Siddiqui, the friend, um, and thank you so much, uh, SOAS, for hosting my first physical book launch of Culinary Tales uh, from Balochistan. I've been food mapping Pakistan because no one has. That's pretty much the reason why um, I started this endeavor. I mean, as a diplomat's daughter, I've been privileged and lived in many countries. And as a result, I have tried and enjoy and love many cuisines from all over the world. And when I had a chance to move back to Pakistan in 2005, I was looking forward to learning, experiencing the full spectrum of what is Pakistani food. And then over time through work and you know, sort of observations, it sort of dawned on me that a lot of our culinary culture was hidden, invisible. And especially from the smaller provinces, smaller in terms of population, not in terms of land. So this bothered me. And then when I had the opportunity, God was very kind, um, I decided that let me chuck my job and do what I really am curious about. So given my background in research, public policy, I sort of had the tools. So I just shifted it into preserving, researching, and documenting our invisible culinary heritage. I start with Balochistan because it is the largest province of the country, the most invisible, and also happens to be my paternal province. 
So that's the short answer. <laughs> Uh, you went to, um, you know, there is there is a recipe from the Murray family. You have you have recorded your interaction with different big families, right? What about food of the poor? Uh, I mean, I didn't get the sense from the book that we, uh, you know, I could understand what the what the ordinary folk. Uh, the underprivileged in, in Balochistan were, were eating. That's interesting you say that because um, the entire book actually focuses on food for of the ordinary. There are actually only one recipe from the Khan of Kalat's kitchen. And that also, he was very kind enough to use his chefs to demonstrate a very common and popular ancient recipe, which is, for the lack of better word, commonly loved in plebeian. So actually, uh, uh, even the Murray recipe, uh, uh, Uncle KB Murray's favorite food, what was um, interesting is that it is the common man's food, which was popular and his favorite. So actually, I would Uncle, say- Uncle KB is? Ker Baksh Murray. Right. So, and there's a chapter dedicated to him. So actually, I would, I'm surprised you said that the book had any elite recipes because actually I would say there isn't a single elite recipe. It is completely and utterly uh, recipes of the common person from across Balochistan, north, south, and coastal. See, but, okay, let me, let me kind of probe you a bit more. So, um, Balochistan is also a province which is underdeveloped, uh, has experienced a lot of, uh, you know, a uh, lot of violence, uh, pressure from the state, uh, definitely deprived of its resources. And in fact, you talk about it. Yes. You know, why, for, for example, this mention of Sui. I mean, we in the rest of Pakistan have been so used to natural gas uh, lighting up our kitchens uh, and warming us up. We rarely talk about how Sui, from where it's produced, has, was, was the last one to get it. So my question to you is that with that kind of underdevelopment, I am sure there are many things, there would be shortages, there'd be droughts, which would affect people's eating habits. Did you talk to them about it? Yes, the, the, in fact, the footprint of Balochistan reflects the socioeconomic conditions. That's, that theme is explored throughout the book. The reason why fundamentals of Balochistani khana food is cured meat, dehydrated milk, and bread. And these three make the foundations of the culinary culture of Balochistan because of no electricity, no gas, extreme uh, weather conditions, and the nomadic and uh, the type of uh, lifestyle of the people in North, Central, South, and coastal, the fishermen uh, folk. So absolutely, the kind of food, the kind of ingredients, and as a result of the ingredients, the kind of recipes that I capture completely and utterly uh, reflects the socioeconomic and the agriculture, the lack of agricultural patterns of the province. Absolutely, it's fundamental. No, but you know, when it comes to meat, I mean, meat is, we are meat lovers and meat eaters. Mm -hmm. So you would find meat in, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, Punjab, in fact, does more vegetables uh, in some ways. So what's, can you explain to our audience here, what makes uh, Baloch cuisine different from rest of the country? 
First, it's not Baloch cuisine because that's an ethnic. So Balochistani, yeah. We have many uh, ethnic groups in Balochistan. And so the, as I said, uh, the fundamental three ingredients which feed into uh, the base of food from the province is dode, krut, and landi. So cured meat, dehydrated milk, um, and bread. And there are vast varieties of these three. And there are many recipes of that in the book. Of course, there are many other recipes, dried fish, for example, dried goat, and many, many others. I mean, you know, there's there's a book full of recipes. So, but these are the three fundamentals reflecting the socioeconomic and the agricultural patterns and the animal husbandry uh, uh, nomadic patterns of the province. So yes, actually, uh, when you talk about vegetarianism, vast majority of Pakistanis, period, not only Balochistan, are vegetarian because meat is expensive. So we love meat and we have it in many uh, forms, but the vast majority enjoy it on special occasions. And to uh, preserve it, they also dehydrate it or cure it as landi or tabahik in the coastal areas. Right, so, but to explain, and that is very different from from elsewhere, from, from whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, the cuisine, uh, the Balochistani cuisine is more akin to Central Asian. So we have less spice. Um, we usually use uh, salt primarily, you know. And so it's, it's very basic bread, uh, very few seasonings and lots of salads actually. You know, there's a lot of raw salads and where some of those salads are considered elite like kale and um a jum uh, which is called jumbo um we have many greens which are considered european and western which are like very common um you know in uh, balochistan and quetta so similarly with uh herbs many of the spices um um uh, what are they called? Basil and rosemary, you know, which are dill, uh, chives, gandana, you know, uh, which we use in our dum dumplings, yogurt. So, you know, like it has a lighter, uh, you know, uh, fresher Central Asian, very low on spice uh, palate. So yes, it's different to the plains where we sort of inundate our food with oil and spices and they're heavy, you know? And um, I won't say like they take more time to cook because there are different reasons why, why it takes a, quite a considerable amount of time to cook or rehydrate. And in general, agrarian societies, pre-modern societies, cooking takes a long time and preparing food takes a long time. So that takes, an, that's another debate. And, you know, we go into a different line of conversation on that, which I do explore in the book as well. So that is similar across for uh, our four provinces. But yes, Balochistani food is very different to what is familiar as uh, Pakistani food, which is Mughalai and Kashmiri. Uh, which is associated with Punjab or, you know, maybe very, the urban centers of Pakistan. So yes, it's Central Asian, ancient Central Asian food. Can you also talk about the team? I mean, you were you on your own? Uh, because I get a sense that despite being from Balochistan, mm -hmm. you are an insider outsider. I mean, you don't really speak, speak the languages. Right. So what was your team, number one, and how did people react to talking to you? Were they, op did they open up? What about your interaction with women? Uh, you know, could you tell us more about, let's step a bit, step outside the book and talk about your journey, uh, mapping, uh, you know, uh, the culinary tales of Balochistan. Uh, how did how did it go? I mean, how did you find the people? That's a really long question, but um, 
It's easier as a woman to enter the private spaces. I mean, this is a country and uh, country and pro uh, provincially as well, which is conservative. It's uh, tribal, feudal. Um, and so entering uh, private spaces, it's much easier for women to negotiate that. And that's where food is cooked. And I was interested in invisible food. So I wasn't interested in food, which were in restaurants or in uh, dhabas, a small, you know, sort of public eateries. So accessing that, uh, those areas, I was privileged because I was female. But other than that, you're absolutely right. Um, I traveled alone. And occasionally I had my editor, uh, who was the editor of uh, Pakistan on a Plate, the video series that um, I have produced, which is online uh, at Neelofer's Corner. He would be on the other side of the camera when we were filming. But when it came to talking to the communities, um, I had, in many instances, interlocutors. So I used, for example, Balochistan Rural Support Program, um, family, friends, three degrees of separation. The Khan of Kalat is a family friend of four generations. I don't know him from Adam, but because I'm a Kazi, and so I could pick up the phone and he would extend his hospitality and, you know, drove down from Karachi and hosted me in Kalat. Um, in Killa Sefulla, um, the Jogazais, again, the last time I met them was when I was maybe a teenager. But again, you know, like the fathers and grandfathers, we're all family friends. So when I requested that I'm curious to explore Killa Sefulla, I had a guide because the families go back generations. So in uh, traditional societies, the linkages, you know, uh, that you have through family matter and you do have access, you know. So, and I was looking and uh, for uh, food and heritage, which haven't been documented. And to do that, I had to enter private spaces. And to do that, um, I had to use a series of networks that I was lucky um, in not only having, but, uh, you know, having the interest in finding those linkages through two, three, four degrees of separation, or even for one degree of separation. So now in terms of their reaction, um, in the household, I would say 99.9%, .9%, maybe 100% are women who cook. So I'm just giving that 0.1% just in case, you know. So in the private uh, domain, uh, food is preserved um, and memory of how it was brought into the family, under what circumstances is it associated with particular cultures or rituals or festivals, it's all in the purview of women. So, um, Yes, you know, like the I'm honoring a lot of women, you know, named and unnamed, many of them and in the book didn't want to be photographed. So that's why, you know, like there are not as many photographs of women, even my own family uh, members, you know, who maintain parta. So no pictures of women where it wasn't allowed. So I have to, I had to, I did and I followed a protocol. Um, I actually honor two uh, very distinguished male chefs associated uh, with food and recipes in Balochistan, who I believe have not been honored in the national landscape and narrative of our culinary heritage. So I have two chapters on them as well. And I explained to you why it, they are important and why I'm acknowledging them as important chefs. So yes, men, of course, have played a significant role in, um, you know, like enhancing and honoring uh, food and culinary culture in Balochistan. Now, anecdotally, when I went out to food map and talked to uh, uh, families and individuals who were reservoirs of traditional food, I would say initially they actually thought I was looking for something else. This was like a conversation, you know, like sort of icebreaker and uh, yes, yes, yes. We, they've been told that she's interested in food and traditional recipes, but she actually must be wanting something else because seriously, like food, 
like it's not really important like how can somebody from outside who's educated who isn't from the province i mean other than a family come all this way spend so much time with us and she's interested in food like our recipes so this was something i saw everywhere that there was very little recognition and honoring and respect of their own tradition which kind of broke my heart and kind of reaffirmed the need to document these recipes because they have no value for these so when or oh, uh, through modernity through you know like whether it's seed change to agricultural patterns or climate change or short cutting or changing of taste buds they're gone you know in fact one of the chefs in gwadar you know who shared seven recipes with me ghafoor saab he died while i was writing the book so i have seven of his recipes and if i hadn't written them down poof gone so fish halwa recipe is preserved because i wrote it down how did it taste fish halwa <laughs> never 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 imagined hi tarik another cousin who i've not seen in so uh so <clears throat> the the question is uh, yeah uh, could you also explain i mean i was very amused by this green halwa and i never <laughs> thought of never thought of halwas being green uh, they've always been either yellow or, or red but green halwa how does it does it taste different um well you know the gwadri halwa is green and i actually asked the question why green and they you know like the um the chefs uh makrani chefs looked at me and said why not you know like so uh, you know they, they, there's no story of why it's green but it's uh, the base is nishasta which is sprouted wheat so it's gluten free um and natural sugars again why because this is an area which doesn't grow sugar so now of course they can get sugar but they invented a recipe where they took wheat and it sprouted you know uh, over a, a few days and that releases natural sugar then they ground that wheat which has you know sort of natural uh, sweeteners and then that they converted into a halwa and then they colored it so and the market for this gwadri halwa is in the gulf right across in oman primarily and bahrain so where you know the the economic uh, relationship is very strong i would say perhaps stronger than um, quetta and the rest of the country as i explain in the chapters you know you you also partly uh, tell the story of oman and gwadar <clears throat> the whole story of how pakistan bought gwadar back from oman one version yeah. one version so a what is the popular version what what ordinary people believe in uh that's one and what are the i mean your your father being from the foreign service and a very senior person at that i'm sure you must have found the story from him as well what did he and oh did you share the story that you heard in in uh, balochistan when when you got back you must have discussed it with him <laughs> i don't know i i don't think i discussed this with baba but um the book is written in a very specific way my opinion doesn't quite matter uh when it comes to what i hear from various quarters and on the issue of gwadar which is the, for those of you who don't know it's the coastal belt of uh, balochistan which is where the cpec is very large um, you know like investment from china and you know like a, it's a very important deep sea uh, deep sea port so it's the coastal belt of uh, balochistan it's also the largest coastal part of pakistan and 970 kilometers long it links karachi to basically the iranian border uh, the entire uh, coast so um, we have been told and it's not told it actually did happen in uh, in the, in the 1950s uh, to be exact i'm not sure it was i think 1958 i uh, i think um 
the state of Pakistan bought Gwadar from the state of uh, Oman. This is a fact. Now, the Khan of Kalat disputes that in that, why did you buy something which we already owned? Because it was very, which is also a fact that it was part of the Khan of Kalat's state, part of the Khanate. So you have these two contradictory histories of a very interesting and large part of Pakistan. And depending on who is telling the story, they have different versions. And then of course the Gwadris have a third version because here you have these two competing states, you know, like the modern state of Pakistan and then the pre-modern state where you had kings, uh, the Khan of Kalat, but you also have a local story as well, who have a very different relationship with both the state and the pre-state Khan of Kalat, who himself actually was an invader to the, to the area. So you have three stories of, of Gwadar. And so I'm not interested in privileging and which is right and which is wrong. The book shares all three. And I leave it to the reader to decide or just learn. Because sometimes it's not about, you know, like which one is right. It's about just giving voice to difference of opinions. And I think especially when it comes to Balochistan, that is the most important thing, that listen to local voices. Uh, you know, according to the public narrative in Pakistan, uh, a state narrative, I would say, and we're told that Balochistan you know, major part of Balochistan is dominated by the Sildars, the tribal system, uh, you know, and you do mention that. But you also have the coastal belt, which is not tribal, you know, which is not dominated by the Sildars. So I'd be curious, I mean, do you see differences in the eating patterns, in the food patterns, the, the two regions? Uh, and let me ask you an even cruder question. Um, who is better fed in, in your mind? I mean, who, who eat better, uh, you know, compared to the other? I mean, I, I, would, I would assume that, uh, I mean, one is, one is, you know, one is about what is available, uh, but power politics does have an impact on who you are, how you are. So, how do you compare the two regions? Um, subsistence living is the norm in Balochistan. So the, uh, Quetta, of course, being the capital, is the, you know sort of this uh, the hub and center, and you know all those who have money either live there or have a home there if they come from you know different parts of the province. There are twenty six. Uh, you know, districts within uh, Balochistan. Um, I can't privilege one or the other. I mean, you know, unfortunately, if you look at numbers by UNICEF or, you know, you know, agencies which are looking at nutrition and, you know, malnutrition, uh, Balochistan is, uh, after Sindh, we have very high malnutrition numbers, you know. So I was focusing on, uh, recording and preserving food. So my observed um, surroundings, I, I was, you know, you had nomads, you had herdsmen, you had uh, people living in mud huts. Uh, they didn't have electricity, um, gas cylinders where, uh, they could afford it. They were used, you know, sort of portable gas cylinders so they could um, cook in the open spaces because in the coastal areas, the weather gets very hot. In fact, it's hot most of the time. So even in December, it's sweltering, you know, so um, they would prefer to cook in sort of open air environment, you know, drought is very common. So when I went, I went to Gwadar a couple of times. Uh, uh, the one time I went, they had got rain after seven years. So rain fed uh, agriculture. That means 
what do you do when you don't have water? They already have a problem with water. They don't have rain. So everything is preserved or um, it comes from Karachi or Iran, very close ties with Iran. So the shops are, the small markets are full of Iranian products and or um, kitchen, garden, you know, sort of uh, subsistence um, uh, uh, growing of vegetables, etc. Or as I said, bread, dried uh, cloth and meat. Hmm. And you do talk about a difference between the Iranian kurta and the, the Baloch, Balochistani kurta. That's right. I spent an, a, a bit of time describing the various varieties of kurt because it's a fundamental ingredient in many of the recipes. And you have Iranian kurt, you have Turkish kurt, you have quet, uh, quetta based kurt, Afghan kurt. And I sort of explained to you what I observed, um, and I can also tell you because I brought some with me, she nearly fainted. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, what other people uh, sort of observe, they privilege the Iranian growth because it's smoother and, you know, it's softer and it's already been uh, rehydrated and properly canned. And, you know, so again, reflecting, you know, sort of better socioeconomic conditions. While you were traveling around, did you come across um, more signs of CPEC and how has CPEC uh, affected the region? What do people say? Uh, you know, you say culinary tales from Balochistan, but I'm sure you're also telling other tales there, some which are in the book, some which are not, you know, uh, as part of, um, you know, what you may have stored in your head. So how was, you know, what kind of impression did you get about CPEC and what did people tell you? Um, Oh, we are totally, uh, you know, moving away from the book, but I mean, those of you who follow me on Twitter, I mean, I've been um, talking about the non-existent of CPEC in Gwadar and in Balochistan from the moment people have been talking about CPEC in Balochistan. There is no CPEC in Balochistan. We have a deep seaport, which uh, is not used. Uh, no one has been employed. I mean, there is no industry, there's no cottage industry, there's no water, there's no CPEC in Balochistan. So CPEC uh, may uh, and does exist, but it has no relationship with Balochistan. And this is what the locals will tell you, and this is my observed uh, view as well. No, but this has affected the lives of fishermen. I mean, very recently, um, there, was, there were protests in Gwadar. Right. So, I mean, I thought you meant in terms of uh, impact positively. Uh, well, impact is both negative. Okay. And yes, of course. Um, the fisher folk have been deeply uh, affected with the large trawlers from China, you know, um, and which go directly from the sea straight to China or wherever. Um, and um, within Gwadar's. Uh, city, you have um, half of Gwadar city cordoned off for the Chinese harbor area, which basically displaced the fisher folk on the East Bank. And this is also discussed a little, a little bit in the book. And so, yes, so they have um, disrupted traditional patterns of uh, fisher folk life and not uh, disruption in terms of bringing modernization and upgrade, et cetera. So we have this a little bit of this conversation. So we have seen no benefit of CPAC in Gwadar. Hmm. But, you know, I was equally amused by what you had written. Uh, no cafes and no restaurants uh, through the entire coastal belt from Gwadar to Karachi. Uh, so where is the footprint of the state? Uh, and I'm really stepping away from the book. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's, it's an interesting conversation also around your book. 
you know, what I, who wants to get me in trouble? I mean, here I'm, you know, I, want, I want the book, uh, people focusing on heritage and culture. And, but you see, the problem is with Balochistan, uh, my, the process of writing this book was political whether I liked it or not, because no one writes on Balochistan. I choose to pick a lens, which is unusual, which is food. And what does food and the recipes tell you about a people who are invisible? A part and corner of Pakistan, which is undiscussed. You know, it does not factor in our imagination. So I want Pakistanis. My audience is Pakistan. Uh, and Pakistanis, even though we are so as, but my audience is Pakistan and Pakistanis. I want you to be curious about the largest province in our country, our country. So um, that's the lens I choose, food. But we all know what are the lenses that Balochistan is looked at. And that is very heavy. It is very unpleasant. It is uh, very sad. And so um, I want to broaden that lensing. I want to broaden the emotion. I want Pakistanis to connect with uh, the, the people at an individual level through what we love and celebrate, which is food. And that makes us Pakistani. All of it makes us Pakistani. So yes, Aisha uh, is referring to what we all think when we think of Balochistan. And that is also true, but I am broadening and pushing the boundaries of forcing you to look at one of the most beautiful parts of Pakistan, 42% no less of Pakistan from a different lens. But Nino, again, let me, let me again push you a bit. See, if you don't have restaurants, if you don't have cafes, if you don't have accessibility of what makes a land accessible to ordinary people, I mean, you are from the Kazi family. I'm a very ordinary Pakistani. And any ordinary Pakistani who travels through Balochistan, if they don't have connections to access the place, naturally you would be looking to you know, to facilities that are there. And if you don't have facilities, how do you then make that part, 42% of that land accessible to the rest of Pakistan? Um, yes, um, yes. I mean, my job is to record and research uh, the recipes before they die out. And what you're talking about is the state and the provincial state managers and the state state managers, the permanent and the unpermanent state managers to uh, make a very large part of Pakistan accessible and safer for everyone inside the province and outside of the province. And why that's the case, we all know. That hasn't changed since 1948. It's just progressively got worse. Um, and uh, technically, a lot of Karachiites do drive down the coastal highway and it's become, become more and more popular. You know, like people go to Las Pela, they go to Gwadar, there are flights from Karachi. But yes, there are no flights to Gwadar from Quetta. So there is this internal um, contradiction, you know, where uh, the state wants Pakistan to have, you know, tourism. And in fact, I think it's, it's touting and, you know, like, saying lots of tourism this and tourism this, but there's very little access to uh, ordinary folks. Like if and I want to go to Balochistan, and even when you go to Balochistan, you probably won't be able to, you know, like find um, too many hotels or motels. And as, as I noted from Gwadar all the way to Karachi, there was not a single cafe on 970 kilometers of highway. So the most beautiful virgin beaches you will ever, ever see. But it, they are not, you know, like um, tourist friendly. They are adventure travel friendly. Um, but they are not, you know, sort of let's, you know, like with our families and, you know, like young kids or whatever, you know, like friendly. 
see it's perhaps this neglect of the of the region that has also contributed tremendously to uh, you know the dissatisfaction amongst people the desire to separate um, and it's so interesting i mean what you also document in your book that a region which started off with the khan of kalat along with the nawab of bahawalpur uh, giving money to the new state of pakistan i mean nobody talks about the khan of kalat giving money to qaid e azam and the new state of pakistan uh you know it's not in our in our textbooks anywhere and, which i uh, mentioned yeah you have mentioned it uh and there is this lot of pent up resentment amongst the people and it's so interesting that you document bits of your interaction with uh nawab khair bakhsh mari um who struggled with who tried in many ways to negotiate with the state of pakistan and then probably realized that there was no negotiating with this with the state of pakistan so could you tell us a bit more or the audience a bit more about nawab khair bakhsh mari what you have about him in this in this chapter here and uh, why did you pick him uh, in particular uh, and use him to uh, you know Uh, use him, you know. He, he there is a chapter about him. Um, Nawab Khair Bakhshmari was my uncle. He was married to my mother's uh, sister, so he was my papa in um, Urdu. So it's the book is full of my relatives and prominent uh, members of the family who had a role in. Um, Balochistan in many forms, culinarily also, but politically, socially, culturally, legally, etc. In fact, Tariq's uh, grandfather, Kazi Isa, you know, was the uh, youngest member of the Muslim League and a very close ally of the Qaeda Azam who created Pakistan. You know, so he, his grandfather ensured Balochistan would be part of Pakistan. So we are. very proud of our family's contribution uh, to ensure the state of pakistan had balochistan so i take that you know um, seriously so uncle kb who is a member of our family had a different view you know and i honor that view as well as i said we have many parts which make us beautiful so the issue was and is that we want all members and all citizens of pakistan and those in balochistan to be honored and as equal citizens in a progressive safe pakistan that was the reason that grew of pakistan as a qazi you know and that's how we grew up understanding the purpose of pakistan so when they are different points of view for legitimate human rights violations and etc you will have different you know like movements and um khair bakhsh mari represented one of those movements and very legitimately i mean he you know is considered to be the father of uh, the baloch tribes baloch you know of a particular ethnic group deeply respected um as a citizen of balochistan so he is included in balochistan in the culinary tales of balochistan because you cannot write a pan book on balochistan and make reference to if you're honoring um, you know people individuals and not include him and he also happens to have a personal connection with me so there was a double reason to mention him um what uh, did i he, yeah was you know he ate simply what kind of food? oh oh yeah i mean, uncle kb was a very very um stoic um kind gentle soft uh man and to the outside world a man of very few words but i 
known him all my life, we had very spirited conversations. Um, he came and stayed with me at Oxford. You know, he was very, you know, was even happy to sleep on the floor. And I, you know, Uncle KB, you have to sleep on the bed. You know, so very humble, you know, and was interested in what I was reading. You know, like met my friends. Uh, we disagreed almost on everything politically. Um, but he was very generous of heart and mind. And I think, you know, as a as a young from obviously seeing me as a child was very uh, encouraging you know like of let her think what she, you know and he argued with me and tried to you know but they never lost his temper you know never was adamant and that says something as an adult now when i think about it you know like um human beings who are confident you know and very secure you know in how what they believe in and their principles don't get angry I mean, you know, because they believe in those uh, views and they have the generosity to listen to difference of opinions, you know, and that's how I saw him, you know, as somebody who always strived towards, you know, like uh, um, simplicity, inclusivity, peace. That's how I see Uncle KB. You know, I'm, I'm glad you talk about it because... You know, for the ordinary uh, Pakistanis and for the youths in the rest of Pakistan, uh, the way Khair Bakshmari, Nawab Khair Bakshmari is presented, it's important to know that is about his generosity, about his ability to engage with people. And perhaps, you know, it's also for us to learn that where he arrived with his politics was also after a lot of discussion and thinking and uh, you know thinking about how to engage i mean he did engage um couple of last things and then we open up the floor for uh, q a um you do talk about women i mean it's a close society yet you do at several occasions in the book you do talk about different women very known women in in Balochistan. Can you, you know, talk us through some of them? Uh, who were they? Uh, why were they known? Why they mentioned the book? Well, I, I start off with my grandmother. Um, I call her Auntie Mummy, and uh, others would know her as Jennifer Musa Kazi. Um, she married my grandmother, uh, a grandfather um, in England, when both of them were studying at Oxford. And uh, they ma married in London and had my father here. And then when uh, Kazi uh, Isa, Tariq's grandfather, my grandfather's younger brother, pol uh, politics in the Muslim League started getting, you know, at a stage where the country was going to be formed in 1947. Uh, my grandfather, who was known as Aga, and my grandmother returned back to Pakistan. And so uh, my grandfather died uh, very young. And so my grandmother, in the tradition of the family, remained in politics. And so she joined what was uh, then known as the National Awami Party, the precursor of the ANP today, Secular Liberal Progressive Party underline secular so um, and she represented the province of balochistan in the constitutional committee which created the 73 constitution which is our constitution today so the signatory to the 73 constitution is my grandmother so she's uh, i mention her and you know in the book several places you know uh, because she was known as mummy of balochistan and you know her home was Pishin and balochistan was uh, everything to her and she lived there she died there and her focus was the welfare of balochistan um shireen bibi which is another relative of uh, mine from my mother's side actually but settled in Balochistan, Shireen Afridi. I have a chapter on her. And um, here she sort of embodies the more traditional, as you would understand, a Pukhtun woman, you know. And her life story 
through the 1935 earthquake, which destroyed Balochistan. It flattened Balochistan. In fact, it is recorded as the worst national natural disaster in the subcontinent in living memory. So that, of course, had a deep impact on the province. And so this chapter is through the eyes of a survivor of the 1935 um, earthquake. And she was an incredible cook. So I honor her and her recipes. At the same time, I share a part of the history which had to be talked about because how many Pakistanis actually even talk about the 1935 um, earthquake? I don't even know if people know there was an earthquake in 1935 that affected this part of what is today Pakistan. And so then through the rest of the uh, book where there is a, a, a all the chefs were women primarily. So, you know, like you hear their names and you hear their backgrounds and whether they're fisher folks' uh, wives or their shopkeepers' wives, uh, the people who are interpreting, uh, you, know, um, you know, conversations with me, you know, about their lives. And then actually also, which was a funny one, the Khan of Kalats, I, I will not reveal, you have to read that chapter, okay? So, um, the Khan of Kalat has his um, ancestry, Shajra, all the way to Prophet Noah. Let's leave it at that. So um, in that, when I saw that, I was like, well, where are the women? I mean, there must be some mother somewhere, right? And so, you know, I, I got these silence and, you know, like, hmm, hmm, hmm. and so they came up with, I will not tell you her name, but they have one woman in the Khan of Kalat's Shajra because she was very prominent. So I tell a little bit about her story as well. And of course, Kali Mata, you know, who's a goddess of, uh, in the Hindu pantheon, um, she was born in Kalat. It is named after Kali Ma. So it's a very, in fact, Balochistan is replete with very holy Hindu sites, but Kali Ma's birthplace is Kalat. And so a very, very revered um, um, temple is in Kalat. So I mentioned that as well in its history, etc. So women visible and invisible have been an integral part of Balochistan's history, um, modern history, and they continue to um, carry and preserve our culinary heritage, which represents our multiple di diverse heritages of the region. So I give you flavors and nuggets and you know snippets of that um, where possible. All right, let me make my one last effort to get you in trouble. <laughs> I thought you already had. No, no, no not as yet. Uh, I mean, while traveling and while researching, I'm sure you came across, uh, and you do kind of slightly mention here and there, footprints of the military in Balochistan. Mm. How, did, how, did, how did that go? I can't not ask you this question. Um, I'm uh, okay. I invoke privilege. I mean, in the sense that yes, uh, that front print is very heavy and is uh, very prevalent. Um, but I am a Kazi, so I mean, I also you know like uh, I can be quite uh, persuasive, you know, as well. So as I, uh, this is a book which I was going to research. So come what may. And so when you are adamant, you will find ways and means. So yes, uh, you did have challenges and you will continue to have challenges, but that's part of the fun. Wonderful. Uh, so now I open up for Q and A, um, any questions? And certainly since the author is here, I uh, encourage you to, buy the book as well and have it signed by her. But before that, let's uh, 
see if people have questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you look at the book, the chapters are actually by location. So I'm from Pishin. So uh, Pishin, Kila Sefola, uh, Quetta, Mastung, Kalat, Las Bela, Gwadar, you know, so like uh, sort of the whole area I mentioned, the Murray areas, um, you know. No, DG Khan doesn't fall under Balochistan. Yes, I mean, I only went to these areas. Yeah, I didn't cover 26 districts. I covered north, central, south, and the coastal. Well, so we, yeah, we will, we will get into the discussion later. Uh, any, yeah. Am I? have any in specific i was sorry i wasn't looking behind it was just like on a, a sort of roll this is yeah okay, just if you bring to any of the recipes okay this is landi this is landi cured um, lamb and it's described how it's made in the book in the first chapter and it hangs for about six to eight weeks in bitter, bitter winter cold. So you have to have very specific kind of uh, conditions. So it, not only cold like a fridge, but it has to be very dry, very, very dry. Otherwise, the meat will rot. So this is a, a kind of cure, uh, curing methodology which happens in Kila, Sefula, Pishin in particular. So it doesn't happen in Quetta. So even in Balochistan, even in the north, it's in a very specific kind of area where the weather conditions allow. And hence, that's where Landi is considered to be very good. Do you have any vegetarian recipes here? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Do we have photos? I'm not sure what they are. But you have? Well, this is um, aubergine. And uh, this recipe honors uh, one of the chefs that I mentioned who needed to pirusa, who uh, has basically uh, for three generations, you know, um, fed um, anyone and everyone who was important in Balochistan because he managed the Pishin rest house. And so all the notables and, you know, from outside of the province and inside the province would come and Piru Saab, who uh, was the big chef over there. And then I tell his story, I'm completely illiterate and self-taught, you know, and so his story um, I share. And so I have two of his recipes here never before written down so his son and i sat and then you know sort of recreated because he also by memory knew his father's recipe so i saw him cook and we recorded his recipe so this is one vegetarian and one non-veg yes please sorry go ahead Um, well, Jamil Saab, my publisher is right behind, and we, in the contract, we have discussed publication in Urdu, you know, which is uh, one of the national languages of the country. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the reaction would be that it would sell more, that's for sure, because uh, there's a 
English language books in Pakistan sell so many. So I think the vast majority of books would be in colloquial languages, you know, in the vernacular languages. So I hope so. I wish so. I tried them all, darling. <laughs> oh, favorite. Hmm. Well, favorite is, you know, Ash, um, which I know how to make, and so does Sofkins. Um, every family has a different Ash recipe. It's like one of those uh, recipes. Uh, those of us who have a Kandahari, um, you know, sort of Balochistan link or, or, or heritage with Afghanistan, those uh, households have an Ash recipe. So the Hazara uh, Ash recipe was very different, you know, so it held a lot of emotion for me because I make an Ash as well. And this was a different Ash. And um, so I really enjoyed that one. You know, it was like uh, looking at uh, food in a food memory. You know, like I, had a, I have a different memory. They have a different memory. We were sh sharing and exchanging, you know, like uh, memory. Um, and also Landi, you know, like um, I made Landi myself, you know, uh, three times since the course of uh, food mapping. And Landi was made last in our household in Kazi house uh, when my grandmother was alive, you know, so again, it was, you know, like kind of carrying on the tradition and then, you know, like oh, I made parcels after eight weeks and I distributed it to, you know, the family and, you know, friends. And so, you know, it was like kind of the sense of community where food was being made, you know, like in great grandfather's house and, I made it and then, you know, I was parceling it and then, you know, sending it to, you know, like um, different parts of the country. And, you know, so that was kind of nice. There were a lot, I mean, Nushul Gai didn't make the cut. We, hopefully in the next version uh, edition we will have, um, which is an interesting um, sort of uh, fruits and dry fruits and nuts kind of a samosa, but not quite, you know? So it was kind of reflective of, you know, like the fruit basket that is Balochistan of Pakistan. You know, we may not be, you know, uh, uh, we have water deficit issues and we are not a big agrarian society, but we are the fruit basket of the country. So uh, that recipe kind of reflected that element. So hopefully in the second edition, Nushul Gai will make the cut. Um, then, you know, what I found, uh, Usman, that, you know, every time I traveled back and went back to Pasheen and then I found there was more I could have written. And I think I drove Jamil Saab and Beacon House insane because I wanted more and more and more. And at some point, you know, like they, there's like, uh, okay, fine. You know, we, this is the deadline and now we need to edit it and, you know, edit it down, et cetera. So I have a very strong sense that edition two, if we ever get into edition three, there will be more because you, there just is so much more, you know? Um, 
grape and manifestations and varieties of grape related stuff, which is absent, you know, when we have an incredible amount of uh, grape related stuff in Balochistan. Um, now the challenges and, you know, distances, I mean, you know, like Balochistan is massive, you know, um, and where do you stay? Like I wanted to go to the interiors, you know, this really heart of Balochistan. In fact, I wanted to even travel to Gwadar through Quetta. I mean, like, you know, cut right across it. So, you know, those are, you know, there's a physical challenge, you know, to some extent less so now, I think security challenge, but logistical challenges and staying time you know, because the distance are really long, you know, our next door neighbor is like four hours away, you know, like, so the very, you know, like uh, distances. And then also uh, you have to spend time, you know, so one is distance, but then also the explore it, because what I'm doing is for the first time, I can't Google it. So, the only way this research comes into being is where I just, I have to actually spend time and it sort of kind of, you know, reveals itself over time and through conversations, through degrees of separation and exploring different avenues. And that takes time, which again, you know, is um, precious and sometimes you don't have the, both the financial resources and just the time and the logistical infrastructure for it to be viable. So um, as I say in the beginning and in the end, I mean, this hopefully is like a platform for deeper, wider inquiry and uh, a more uh, methodological and more intense interest in Balochistan, you know, people-wise, location-wise, food-wise, food mapping-wise, but this is a start. So it kind of hopefully tickles the senses of whoever, from whatever angle, to do more. Thank you. <laughs> um, buy the book and you will see the recipes. So that answers the first question, okay? On the second question, I think we've gone through this like in like multiple ways and the answer is yes. I have never seen so many check posts in my life. And we live in check post central in Pakistan. So that goes without saying. And I did not ask them about what their food was and what they were interested in because they weren't local. So I was not interested. Which actually reminds me that you have a chapter on Baloch, uh, Balochistani settlers in Isaba. Mm -hmm. um, don't you think you should have had something on the, the others settled in Balochistan? I, I know you talk about Hazaras, but yeah. well, you see the settler, the chapter on the settlers of uh, Balochistan are displaced people, you know, so they had to leave, whether for socioeconomic reasons or otherwise, and the numbers are growing so large, so hence I had a chapter on them. Um, and the impact and what kind of culinary culture do they bring with them, you know, wherever they are settled. And in this case, I was talking about Islamabad and the outskirts of Islamabad. 
But what you're talking about, Balochistan's had waves of migration, you know, like over centuries, you know, even the Seva dynasty, which is like um, uh, thousands of years old, uh, the, technically the, even the Khan of Kalat, you know, and the Kalatis claim, you know, the connections from, you know, uh, Syria. So, and uh, the Pukhtuns, you know, like uh, coming from Central Asia uh, down as well, so everyone is actually a settler at Balochistan, you know, so at different stages of history. And I, I discussed that there are various groups and ethnic groups and their mythology related to where they come from and whose ancestry um, they link themselves. It's a very Pakistani thing. I'm not from here. I'm from somewhere else, you know, um, so it, it, it's also interesting but we are central asian you know like the vast majority of uh, people who come from balochistan have linkages to central asia but uh, of course in uh, the last uh, 70 100 years you have people coming from the east as well you know like so you have many communities you know who are not pashto speaking bravi speaking or baloch speaking or farsi speaking who uh, whose home is Balochistan. And believe you me, they are from Balochistan. My father grew up with them and they're very much a part of the fabric of what is Balochistan. question i mean it's the reason why i food map pakistan you know like um then i pontificate over why so much of our culinary culture is invisible you know um and uh, ironically the saji that you talk about what is outside of balochistan is usually chicken saji uh you know so you know like there's a, a different you know like take on which is fusion and modern and you do want it of course you know like who decides you know what is and what isn't i'm i'm actually fundamentally concerned that what is our traditional food and it's recorded what people do after with it is not my concern in fact welcome to and it sort of brings in modernity and you know fusion and you know is it influences other food patterns and recipes etc that's how you know nouvelle cuisine was created you know like and how you know sort of uh, incredible you know global cuisine it borrows from so many traditions you know and techniques etc so we have such diversity and such breadth in our culinary culture so step one record it step two understand it and then step three four i leave to someone else Thank you, Neetu. Um, I think identity politics is um, is very integral. I mean, I'm very secure in my identity as a Pakistani. I am a Pukhtun. I'm a Pakistani. I come from two provinces. But I find that having come back to Pakistan, you know, uh, 
this question of what is Pakistani, you know, like somehow is, you know, like constantly being revisited and manufactured to some extent. And, you know, like uh, I'm very uncomfortable with some of the stuff that I see, I don't recognize. And, you know, like it's not how I see and, you know, envision um, the country and people, etc. Food also has started to reflect that. And I saw that connection as a political scientist, you know, the invisibility of our diversity, the, you know, the um, lack of acknowledgement of the larger Pakistan and Pakistanis. So instead of going in the repetitive cycle that is Pakistani politics and Pakistani identity politics or the conversation about Pakistan, uh, by Pakistanis about Pakistan for Pakistan, I decided we just change the lens. And since no one's done it, it really needed to be done anyway, you know. And which country has not food mapped its, you know, its culinary heritage? I mean, in the 21st century. I mean, it's shocking that we haven't done it already. So, you know, it's kind of a combination you know, of an interest and in training and a complete absence of anyone having done it. So, it, you know, it's sort of the two sort of gelled. The next thing that I'm going to do is, inshallah, do the KP book, which will not be called KP. Please. Those of you who um, know, uh, know me, uh, Pakistan on a Plate is a series um, on YouTube, Nilo First Corner, 53 episodes, which cover um, all of Pakistan. Now, as I said, I food mapped 100 districts. So I've really done um, all of Pakistan. The books, this is the first of four books. So the next book is my maternal province, which is currently called KPK, but the book will not be called KPK. So uh, then hopefully, you know, Sen, then Punjab and others. And what, what I want, what I want, I don't know what I want. I want people to enjoy the book, buy the book, buy lots of the book. Um, just to think about, you know, like my country, my people, my food, uh, you know, with love and interest and curiosity, that's what I want. A, a very uh, wide, uh, <laughs> deep, wide question. Um, I believe there was Aurat March in Quetta organized. They had difficulty, um, but they still continued. And I think they started with the Balochistan University sort of platform. As you know, in Gwadar, we recently had massive, uh, you know, uh, protests and rights and women were involved in it as much. Women are involved at every level of uh, every activity in Balochistan, whether you acknowledge it or you don't acknowledge it. I mean, they are fundamental to everything from cooking to culture to human rights to everything. So uh, this, and by the way, this is um, 
this happens within the traditional boundaries, this happens in a modern boundary, this happens within the feudal structures. This is reality. So how you see it and how you acknowledge it or don't acknowledge it, that it just depends on the narrator or the recorder. So I think, uh, I hope my book does capture that sense because that is the truth, you know. Um, yeah. Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which is the name of the province, uh, the third largest province, we're four. Punjab is the largest in terms of population. Um, then you have Sindh, then you have KPK, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. The reason why, and then uh, you have Balochistan. Balochistan is the largest in terms of uh, population, which is 42% of uh, the country, area-wise, yeah, land-wise. And so the reason why I was like just being facetious on KPK is that the name of KPK used to be called the Frontier Province. And so, you know, it's, it's had many uh, names. And before that, there was also another name. So I haven't decided what I'm going to call it because this is an area which, again, you know, how you define this area is interesting. Like it recently, the FATA districts, which were the federally administered territories, have now been included into KPK. So as the book suggests, and I will repeat myself, we are an ancient people in a young country. So everything that we uh, capture and write in whatever form and whatever lens reflects that. So borders, currently, we are in Pakistan. So I talk about Pakistan and the land that we have today that constitutes Pakistan. But I also share, you know, um, our histories and our connections, you know, and our shared, you know, um, past and identities, you know, so it's kind of all combined. Yeah, sure. Fantastic. What was the criteria? How long was Um, ask Jamil Saab that question, you know, on the availability uh, for Pakistan. I hope soon. Um, Pakistan on a plate has been uh, swimming in my mind, and I, I touch upon this whole process in the book. So I leave. I will not answer it here. Buy the book, and you will read it. Um, and. Um, the recipes chose me. I didn't choose the recipes. I didn't do any filtering. Where I uh, came across um, uh, a recipe which was, the criteria was that it's not in a restaurant, it's not in a dhaba, and it hasn't been published. That was my criteria. I'm making invisible visible, and I'm documenting the undocumented. That's the criteria. Um, actually, guadri halwa, anything that takes a lot of strength, you know, like uh, made in very large quantities and requires an incredible amount of manpower, you know, um, um, the domain of men. So large scale food, you know, or um, baking, the very large stuff that men do. Yes, I mean, and this is something I um, share with you that uh, in the book, traditional food obviously don't have recipe cards and, you know, measuring uh, um, ingredients to an exact science, but I do that for you. And hence, Culinary Tales of Balochistan is a recipe book. It's a cookbook. So you, if you have the uh, ingredients, you can replicate it. Oh, I would say 95% of the stuff that you're going to read, I would 
said, I would say that you probably have never heard of it. So, I mean, you know, guan soup, for example, which is uh, wild pistachio bean soup, you know, um, which is very rare uh, for most Pakistanis. Uh, I would actually safely say outside of Pakistan, probably no one knows about it, you know. Um, fish halwa, I mean, outside of maybe uh, one state in Sindh, I don't think anyone's really tried it, knew about it. But it makes perfect sense because it's, you know, a product of uh, fisher folk. I mean, you know, everything is fish. They eat dried fish, you know, and why wouldn't they sweeten fish? Why wouldn't they make a sweet meat out of it? Um, well, Amazon.co.uk has it and BeaconBooks.net, my publisher's website, also has it. And if you happen to be here, you can also purchase it over here. Um, and there is one other uh, bookdepository.com, which is also a global um, distributor. What is your next? Um, I hope to write uh, the next book and get focused on that. You know, hopefully I'll begin in late summer and because I have four to write, so I need to get going. We have so many positive comments. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank but you. We have someone here uh, in the US um, who is 78 years old and just want to find out more about cuisine. So... Thank you. Thank you so much. Very kind. I hope I'll get a chance to see every one of the comments and also respond to them where I can. Thank you so much for listening and participating. By the book. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. The book is here for you to buy, get signed by the author. And my one last comment for Jamil Saab is, Jamil Saab, next version of it, you have to make this book more accessible. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Farida. Thank, thank you. So